All right, folks, my name is Daryl Weathers, and I'm with the Construction Workers Union. I work with a lot of fine men who have families to feed. Now, I don't know about you all, but we work long and hard to get our pay up to a level where we can make a decent living. And these night fears took our jobs. Yeah, they're down. Well, they took our jobs. Night fears took, took our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. These damn yeah. night fears yeah. took our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Kick them out. Put them in our brain. Yeah. Yeah. Erotic.com. You have been told many lies of Middle Earth. Some run so deep. Even the rocks and roots now believe them. We certainly have been told many lies about Middle Earth. From Amazon, lies about the fans, lies about the reviews, lies about removing reviews, lies about respecting Tolkien's lore, lies about how many people actually watch this show. Tell me, Amazon, how is that all critics of your billion dollar disaster, The Rings of Power, are racist narrative holding up? <laughs> dozens and dozens of access media articles with essentially the same headline calling fans racist and even dinosaur legacy broadcast television chiming in with Whoopi Goldberg and the terminally unfunny Trevor Noah. There are <laughs> critics who are saying they were too woke by adding, yes, <laughs> adding diverse characters. Are you telling me black people can't be fake people too? <laughs> yeah. Is that what you're telling me? You can be a dragon. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. I mean, on the one hand, Everyone wants diversity in the shows that we create. But on the other hand, you gotta admit, it's a bit unrealistic <laughs> to say that there were black people in this white guy's imagination. You know, I mean. It's already down the memory hole. Didn't think you could keep that up for six weeks. And my email is being flooded with rejected reviews on Amazon Prime. By the way, keep them coming. Speaking of reviews, remember all those positive ones prior to the premiere episode from The Usual Suspects? The regular old shills are on to their next goodie bag. Wakanda Forever is right around the corner. And the Tolkien shills, unfortunately, after siding with Amazon, are dealing with some consequences. Speaking of down the memory hole, Amazon's been awfully quiet quiet since announcing that 25 million people watched, I'm sorry, sampled the premiere. And no, 25 million people did not watch your premiere episode. I name you liar, Amazon, and ask you to prove it. Show us the numbers and prove me wrong. Sure, I've been warning for three years that this precise thing would happen to Lord of the Rings and its fandom, that Amazon would come in subvert Tolkien and turn it into an intersectional nightmare, shielding themselves behind diversity and using fake woke marketing or what some might call in the access media, fan baiting, which we'll get to later. I said there would be modern messaging. I said there would be allegory. I said there would be warrior Galadriel. We're half through this abomination of a season and that's exactly what we got and there's so much worse to come. Obviously, I'm not some genius. I just recognized a pattern over the last few years, and a lot of this pattern came from one particular company, Bad Reboot. You remember Bad Reboot? The same company that, while the country was burning down in 2020, said things like, no more white comfort, and completely destroyed Star Trek and Star Wars. So a lot of us were right about everything, and I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I doubt any of them need an apology, and neither do I. But you know who's owed one? the Tolkien fandom, and we all know they'll never get it. That's okay, Amazon. Have it your way, because we'll continue to mock your show and the shill access media who supported you into oblivion. Again, here we are halfway through the season. Nothing has happened, but one thing is crystal clear. This show is not going to get any better. It is hot garbage. Abandon any hope of anything turning around this season. Remember last week when we got one of the professor's favorite things, allegorical symbolism? Well, this week they decided to drop the symbolism and go full allegory. And it happens in the first three minutes. Girl Sildur, the made-up sister of a Sildur, witnesses populism, nationalism, and an immigration allegory, all from the perspective of the modern Hollywood writer. And yes, they went full. They took our gerbs. They took our gerbs. Oh, yeah, they're down. They took they're our down. They did. And going as far as to call the Queen Regent Muriel an elf lover subtle. Strangely enough, the guy who looks like Karl Marx Farazon ends up giving what Hollywood perceives as a MAGA nationalist speech. Now, you might think I'm being a little hyperbolic with this. Nope. But exactly where we find them is the beginning of potential polarization between a sort of uh, uh, 
a nationalistic view and a much more much more loyalty to the elven side of their nature. And for good measure, if you didn't pick up that Karl Marx Farazan was a popular guy, they have his son telling girl Sildur that he's a popular guy. He isn't a name in the city he doesn't know. Crowdy can't turn a favor he isn't a. It's impressive. I was going to say infuriating. Now, this particular episode is truly the rings of girl power, featuring not one, not two, but three incompetent girl bosses. Guy Ladriel acts insufferable. Queen Regent Muriel flares her nostrils as they argue about Sauron. I'm sorry, Halbrand, who's totally not like Aragorn. I believe the man you hold in your dungeons is no common brawler, but the lost heir in exile to the throne of the Southlands. Then there's some repurposed Lord of the Rings dialogue. There's no strength left in the world of men. A scattered, divided, leaderless. His people are scattered, leaderless. Is there a f***ing echo in here? Muriel flares her nostrils again and says she doesn't believe Guy Ladriel and then takes a shot at Elendil. And I suppose Elendil here is a runic emperor. It's the petty lord, actually. You'd think a queen regent of Numenor would know her histories and know that Elendil is descended from a Numenorian king and a descendant of Elros, brother of Elrond. Queen Regent Muriel denies warrior Galadriel's request to give her some ships, some men and women, Halbrand, so she can go to war in the Southlands. That's when Guy Ladriel once again demands to see the manager, followed by that signature cringe Rings of Power dialogue. There's a tempest in me. It swept me to this island for a reason, and it will not be quelled by you, Regent. Try me, bitch. Then Guy Ladriel gets locked up, and I can hear the Guy Ladriel stand saying right now, see, she's not a Mary Sue. She was humbled. Not exactly. One of the traits of a Mary Sue is their flaws are endearing, and they end up getting what they want anyway and being right all along. And sorry, spoilers, that's what happens. Sauron, sorry, Halbran, mocks her a little bit for getting locked up and then says this. Has it ever occurred to you that you're not battling trolls or orcs, but men? Are you really about to advise me in the art of war? No, no. I, <laughs> I wouldn't dare. But then... Queen's Court isn't exactly your usual battlefield, is it? No, in the lore with the real Galadriel, the royal court is precisely where her battlefield is, seeing that she's royalty, not a battle commander. We saw this with General Leia. We saw it with King Valkyrie, and now we're seeing it with Warrior Galadriel. The subversion of gender norms in Tolkien. Sauron, sorry, Halbrand, then recaps the previous scene so we can see what really pissed off Queen Regent Muriel just in case we missed it the first time. Once again, asking to go see the manager, the king, which is strange because totally not Sauron wasn't in that scene. Thank God for small favors, no Harfoots in this one, but we did get Don Lemonless and Bronwyn and... Even though it did take about a half an hour of the episode, there's not much to go over here. I mean, aside from orcs treating their dead better than Harfoots. After the tease of last week, we finally get a good look at Adar, who is just an evil elf who really likes his orcs for some reason. He mercy kills one. He looks really sad about it. And then things get dumb. Adar tells Don Lemonless he's been told many lies and that he might want to be a god. After some small talk, Adar tells Don Lemonless he's going to let him go, but he has to deliver a very very important message so important that he's gonna let him have his weapons back and i'm sure he's gonna tell the other orcs not to mess with them or kill him and this message must be one hell of a revelation right nope so girl boss bronwyn who by the way is just clean as can be nice makeup her hair looks good and everybody else looks like they've been rolling around in poop has led everyone to the watchtower like the good girl boss she is except they completely forgot to bring food yet they had plenty of time if there are you here who want to live? We make for the Elven Tower at first light. Where's the rest? That is the rest. 
This is just a lame contrivance to get Theo to go back to the town to get some food with his friend in Silnor so Theo can run into an orc. And by the way, they left all their livestock too. Why didn't he just leave the sword hilt there? That's what this entire contrived, long, boring scene ended up being about. In Silnor abandons Theo and Theo fights off the orcs again in a very contrived manner only to be saved by Deus Ex Don Lemonless, who was indeed given back his weapons and the orcs try to kill both of them immediately. We get a slow motion scene of orcs attacking them in the forest, Don Lemonless catching arrows and shooting them back. Remember arrows. And in the middle of the forest, in the middle of the night, Bronwyn somehow finds them, but it's okay. They escape the forest into a field. The sun rises and the orcs thankfully decide not to loose their arrows until the worst possible moment. So what did we learn from these scenes? Other than they were long and boring, not much. Adar is looking for the sword hilt. That's why he dug that big ass trench that no one noticed from the watchtower. And that big important message from Adar couldn't have been more cliche. It was just surrender or die. That's it. And the Southern Barkeep, well, he's totally down with Sauron. Couldn't have figured that one out. If you heard of him, lad. If you heard of Sauron. <laughs> Meanwhile, Elendil, future High King of Arnor and Gondor, and his son Asildur, major players in the Second Age, are reduced to C-list characters whose actions aren't even worth mentioning. Asildur and his friends got fired from the Numenorean Navy because Asildur was distracted by some mysterious voice calling him to the West. In the books, there is a ban on sailing to the West, but in the context of this show, they have said nothing about it. And girl Sildur just exists to witness things. Back to Guy Ladriel, who's set to be released and escorted back to the elves. But we know our great warrior, the Wastelands, the commander of the Northern Armies and Scourge of the Orcs ain't having any of that. In what might be, so far, the most cringe scene in all of this series, she defeats not one, not two, not three, not four, five Numenorean guards with ease, doesn't even break a sweat, and smirks. This abysmal choreography reminds me of something. Of course, they had to quickly cut away from this fight because the very short Morphin Clark looks ridiculous fighting men who are a foot and a half taller. Down with the patriarchy, that's, that's the message. Our insufferable Mary Sue escapes, climbs a tower, breaks into the queen's chamber, and confronts Muriel with absolute ease. Guy Ladriel finally gets her meeting with the manager and she finds out that the king is indeed sick. Then we get some actual lore from the books that's just talked about. My father was always restrained in his beliefs. But after his coronation, something changed. He became strident, claiming that we provoked the anger of the Valar and must repent and return to the old ways. More tell, not show. If you haven't figured out by now, Numenor is doomed. They showed us Muriel's premonition at the beginning of the episode, and then they show essentially the same scene, except with Galadriel, which ended up being one of my favorites. Once again, we get a repurposed line from Lord of the Rings. Palantir, they show many visions. Some that will never come to pass. For the mirror shows many things. And some things that have not yet come to pass. Then we get a little moment between the girl bosses where Guy Ladriel discovers that she's not the only one who's always right. Muriel's always right, too. I know what it is. To be the only one, the only one who sees, the only one who knows. Queen Regent Muriel once again denies Guy Ladriel's request to go to war. Like all the time spent on the Harfoots last episode that really led to next to nothing, the same thing is going on with the dwarves. It just looks a little better. We transition to Eregion with Elrond and Celebrimbor, who's sizing him up like a piece of meat. It is everything you said it would be. What? Remember that proposal that Elrond had for the dwarves in episode 2 that we really never saw accepted? Well, that happened off screen. Will they show us something rather than tell us? Sure, and then they'll tell us about it. Elves and dwarves working together. Mark. 
guess we'll just have to take their word for it because I don't see any dwarves and elves here. But this presents a bit of a problem. How much time has passed? It seems like it's only been a couple of days with Don Lemonless. Same with our Haddad activist. Same with Guy Ladriel. Now, I know elves and dwarves work fast, but... That is a minimum of months. Don't forget, everyone was connected in the same timeline with the comet. They also did away with the map this episode, so the insecure and weak Grandma Brimbor sends Elrond next door to cause a doom. This is applicable for this entire series, but a lot of time and money was spent on these Elrond and Durin scenes where next to nothing happens, the story barely moves forward. Essentially, we find out what was in the mystery box in episode two if you were awake enough to remember. Mithril. Remember Mithril from Lord of the Rings? And it's supposed to be incredibly dangerous and difficult to mine, which is supposed to foreshadow what we saw in the trailer. The Balrog. Remember the Balrog from Lord of the Rings? Otherwise, it's a bunch of forced, pointless, soulless drama with no setup and only a very superficial payoff. Apparently, Durin the Third is mad at Durin the Fourth. Why? Well, we're told this, but we only see the apology. But what we do get to see is Disa Singh and Disa Thai. After Elrond discovered what the dwarves were hiding, now it's time for a new mystery for our mystery box. What are the elves hiding? I suppose we'll find out in two or three episodes. It's a big problem, though. I don't care. In our final scene, Guy Ladriel is being sent back to the elves by Queen Regent Muriel. She's told very kindly to go in peace by Elendil, and she responds with resting bitch face. The scene is comprised of a lot of looking and looking and looking. And then finally... Looking at some leaves falling. As the leaves of Nimloth fall, we get repeated dialogue from early in the episode, and I'm starting to think this might be a courtesy considering most of us are falling asleep watching this. Could it be a portent or just a strong breeze? I don't really care. And what we all knew what was going to happen throughout the entire episode finally happens at the very end. Guy Ladriel gets exactly what she wants. With Guy Ladriel, the girl barbarian warrior, the wasteland scourge of the orcs and commander of the northern armies, and some of the brave sons and daughters of Numenor. <laughs> Never mind the fact, in future episodes, those daughters seem to disappear. Kind of like the elves, harfoots, and dwarves of Kalur in the Third Age. And yes, this is the battle later on in the season where we get Cheeto Gyladriel. And that wraps it up. Intersectional repurposed mystery box with a Tolkien skin. Who's Adar? Mystery box. What are Gilgalad and Grandma Brimbor up to? Mystery box. Who's the stranger? Mystery box. Theo's sword? Mystery box. Who's Sauron? Well, it's Halbrand, but... Mystery box. What's a mystery box? Briefly, it's a Jar Jar Abrams and Bad Reboot creation. It's a box with nothing in it because it's just about the mystery. And it's also a cheap and easy way to avoid difficult things like plot and characterization. And what's the point? We know Sauron comes back. Rings get forged. Numenor falls. There's a war of the last alliance that ultimately they lose. And Galadriel is only part of one of those stories. And oh my God, they're going to put her in the war of the last alliance, aren't they? Again, we're halfway through, and there has been no real character or story progression. There is an unlikable lead and a moron queen. Heartless, soulless, and despite all of its diversity, there's no one to identify with. Not that I thought it'd really help, but I made those videos three years ago because I didn't want to see this kind of discourse in the Tolkien fandom. It's a nice old fandom that deserved better, but good for you for standing up and not taking the blame on this one, like other fandoms have, and staying true. As far as fan baiting goes, yes, there have been a hundred YouTube channels covering this for years, but marketing, fake woke marketing, fan baiting, is only part of it. It does not absolve the critics who either took part in attacking fans or could have said something and didn't and it doesn't absolve the repurposers and hacks who embed the message in all of our favorite stories. And to the shills who continually decide to sell their integrity for goodie bags and cup warmers, you're going to be replaced by the fans. And this is a good thing. You brought this on yourselves. And the only thing that will be left for you to say will be, They took our job! If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Nerderotic.com Cast it into the fire! Destroy it!